Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for coming out on this absolutely beautiful day. Uh, we have a very, very special treat in store for you today. Uh, as you know, uh, the images from the James Webb Telescope have been changing our uh, understanding of the universe, it seems, almost on a weekly basis. And like many of you, I have been looking at those images and absolutely astounded. Uh, by the way, my name is Charles Nazarian, and I'm the president of the Boston Meeting House Foundation. And it is my pleasure to welcome you here for another uh, very unusual event. And that's what we specialize here at the Meeting House, in events that you're not likely to find anywhere else. Um, this afternoon's show came together as a result of uh, those incredible images challenging my mind and many others. And uh, uh, Rob Newton, who is the head of the KK Community Cinema, who is a real space nut. And we started talking about this and said, well, I would love to write a script to go with the James Webb Telescope images. And then he suggested that we get Dana Percy from Channel 38, formerly from Channel 38, to be the narrator because he has such a velvety and wonderful <laughs> voice. And we called Dana and he said, yes, I'll do it for you. And I said, well, you know, we don't have a big budget. And he said, well, I'm happy to do it for you, Travis. Oh. And then we called back. Thank you, Dana Percy. Krasinski, who has played here many, many times, accompanying silent movies, uh, took up the challenge of improvising instead of to um, uh, silent movies for an hour or more, although you're going to get one silent movie this afternoon, a short one, uh, to improvise in organ music what you're seeing in the image from the James Webb Telescope. So this is completely improvise and he's going to open with a somewhat spacey overture. <laughs> We're going to go from that into the movie from 1902, which is uh, called La Voyage dans la Lune, the, one, the, the trip to the moon, or in the moon, literally. And that's why the poster that you will see has the space uh, chip going right into the eye of the core moon. Uh, and then after that, there'll be a little bit of information about the uh, James Webb Telescope and how it evolved. And then the slides will begin uh, with the accompaniment on the organ. So the uh, real multimedia uh, presentation. Uh, we are videoing it, and it will be available on our YouTube channel at Gloucester Meeting House if you go looking for it in a day or so. I do want to say a few words of thanks also to our sponsors of the series that we run from September until May. Uh, these sponsors make possible our programs, which uh, we could not possibly do without them being on the video. And uh, we want to give them a good round of applause. I've also noticed in greeting many of you coming in that you have, many of you have not been here before. So I want to say a few words about the Meeting House and what we're about. Uh, the Meeting House was built in 1806 for the first Universalist congregation that ever gathered in America here in Gloucester. And the uh, minister of the church was a gentleman off to my right, whose name is John Murray, and his wife is Judith Sargent Murray, and her portrait is off to my left. Uh, they kind of turned the um, world, at least the state world, upside down, because he believed in a loving God and um, that all people were God's children, basically. And up until that time, the uh, Calvinist uh, pre Puritan Congregational Church ruled. It was the only recognized church in Massachusetts. And uh, among other things, he was the chaplain to the Rhode Island Regiment under George Washington because of his liberal religious views. 
And his wife is credited as being America's first female playwright. She was lobbying for women to have equal educational rights with men. And she was writing to the founders, to Franklin and to Jefferson, insisting that women had a vote in the original Constitution. Now, the name power couple didn't really exist then, but they were definitely a power couple. And that is the reason why this building, with 600 seats and in the magnificent federal style, is here today. We're very fortunate that it still stands. Uh, all of the other examples have been lost, mostly to fire, over the years. Thankfully, the Boston Reading House Foundation, which is separate from the church, was created to preserve the building, and we have been able to add a fire sprinkler system to the entire building, up to the top of the tower, uh, fireproofing the walls, all kinds of systems to protect it, and other improvements, including uh, just finishing the tower restoration. And so um, we work very hard to see that this building will survive to the next few centuries, we hope, in service to the North Shore community. And it just happens to have, by uh, purpose, actually wonderful acoustics because of the way it was built in its time. So it makes a great place for music and for um, presentations that crazy folks like us cook up to provide for all of you. Um, I told many of you on the way in how to find a comfort station, and I don't want to end my reading without uh, letting you know that if you need the facilities, you go through this door in the end of the hall, and if that's busy, you can go down and there are two more. And please, before we begin the program, make sure that your phones and devices are quieted so that um, it won't uh, interrupt the program for everybody. So uh, we're going to start with Maestro Krasinski. Uh, I should say about Peter that um, some people may be considered fine organists. He is a powerhouse. <laughs> And uh, what he brings to the instrument is quite amazing. And what he's going to start with with his overture, I think, will simply speak for itself. So, Peter, take it away.
The picnic near the lakeside in Chicago is the start of a lazy afternoon, early one October. We begin with a scene one meter wide, which we view from just one meter away. Now every 10 seconds, we will look from 10 times farther away, and our field of view will be 10 times wider. This square is 10 meters wide, and in 10 seconds, the next square will be 10 times as wide. Our picture will center on the picnickers, even after they've been lost to sight. 100 meters wide. The distance a man can run in 10 seconds. Cars crowd the highway. Power boats lie at their docks. The colorful bleachers are soldiers field. This square is a kilometer wide, 1,000 meters. The distance a racing car can travel in 10 seconds. We see the great city on the lake shore. 10 to the fourth meters, 10 kilometers. The distance a supersonic airplane can travel in 10 seconds. We see first the rounded end of Lake Michigan, then the whole great lake. 10 to the fifth meters, the distance an orbiting satellite covers in 10 seconds. Long parades of clouds, the day's weather in the Middle West. 10 to the sixth, a one with six zeros, a million meters. Soon the Earth will show as a solid sphere. We are able to see the whole Earth now, just over a minute along the journey. The Earth diminishes into the distance, but those background stars are so much farther away that they do not yet appear to move. A line extends at the true speed of light. In one second, it half crosses the tilted orbit of the moon. Now we mark a small part of the path in which the Earth moves about the sun. Now the orbital paths of the neighbor planets, Venus and Mars, then Mercury. Entering our field of view is the glowing center of our solar system, the Sun. Followed by the massive outer planets, swinging wide in their big orbits. That odd orbit belongs to Pluto. A fringe of a myriad comets too faint to see completes the solar system. Ten to the fourteenth. As the solar system shrinks to one bright point in the distance, our sun is plainly now only one among the stars. Looking back from here, we note four southern constellations, still much as they appear from the far side of the Earth. This square is 10 to the 16th meters, one light year, not yet out to the next star. Our last 10 second step took us 10 light years further. The next will be 100. Our perspective changes so much in each step now that even the background stars will appear to converge. At last, we pass the bright star Arcturus and some stars of the Dipper. Normal but quite unfamiliar stars and clouds of gas surround us as we traverse the Milky Way galaxy. Giant steps carry us into the outskirts of the galaxy. And as we pull away, we begin to see the great flat spiral facing us. The time and path we chose to leave Chicago has brought us out of the galaxy along a course nearly perpendicular to its disk. The two little satellite galaxies of our own are the clouds of Magellan. 10 to the 22nd power, a million light years. Groups of galaxies bring a new level of structure to the scene. Glowing points are no longer single stars, but whole galaxies of stars seen as one. We pass the big Virgo cluster of galaxies among many others, a hundred million light years out. As we approach the limit of our vision, we pause to start back home. This lonely scene, the galaxies like dust, is what most of space looks like. This emptiness is normal. The richness of our own neighborhood is the exception. The trip back to the picnic on the lakefront will be a sped-up version, reducing the distance to the Earth's surface by one power of ten every two seconds. In each two seconds, we'll appear to cover 90% of the remaining distance back to Earth. Notice the alternation between great activity and relative inactivity, a rhythm that will continue all the way into our next goal, a proton in the nucleus of a carbon atom beneath the skin on the hand of the sleeping man at the picnic.
10 to the 9th meters, 10 to the 8th, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We are back at our starting point. We slow up at 1 meter, 10 to the 0 power. Now we reduce the distance to our final destination by 90% every 10 seconds, each step much smaller than the one before. At 10 to the minus 2, 1 one hundredth of a meter, 1 centimeter, we approach the surface of the hand. In a few seconds, we'll be entering the skin crossing layer after layer from the outermost dead cells into a tiny blood vessel within. Skin layers vanish in turn. An outer layer of cells, felty collagen. The capillary containing red blood cells and a roughly lymphocyte. We enter the white cell. Among its vital organelles, the porous wall of the cell nucleus appears. The nucleus within holds the heredity of the man in the coiled coils of DNA. As we close in, we come to the double helix itself, a molecule like a long twisted ladder whose rungs of paired bases spell out twice in an alphabet of four letters the words of the powerful genetic message. At the atomic scale, the interplay of form and motion becomes more visible. We focus on one commonplace group of three hydrogen atoms bonded by electrical forces to a carbon atom. Four electrons make up the outer shell of the carbon itself. They appear in quantum motion as a swarm of shimmering points. At 10 to the minus 10 meters, one angstrom, we find ourselves right among those outer electrons. Now we come upon the two inner electrons held in a tighter swarm. As we draw toward the atom's attracting center, we enter upon a vast inner space at last the carbon nucleus, so massive and so small. This carbon nucleus is made up of six protons and six neutrons. We are in the domain of universal modules. There are protons and neutrons in every nucleus, electrons in every atom, atoms bonded into every molecule out to the farthest galaxy. As a single proton fills our scene, we reach the edge of present understanding. Are these some quarks in intense interaction? Our journey has taken us through 40 powers of 10. If now the field is one unit, then when we saw many clusters of galaxies together, it was 10 to the 40th, or 1 and 40 zeros. The cosmos is all that is, or ever was, or ever will be. Our feeblest contemplations of the cosmos stir us. There is a tingling in the spine, a catch in the voice, a faint sensation as if a distant memory or falling from a height. We know we are approaching the greatest of mysteries. Carl Sagan Astronomy. 
the fascinating and ever-evolving scientific study of once and still mysterious celestial objects, stars, planets, comets, nebulae, galaxies, and the unfathomably vast universe as a whole. The hunter-gatherers, our early human ancestors from two and a half million years ago, were likely the first to make astronomical observations. They would have used the stars to navigate and track the seasons to maximize their yields of edible plants and animals essential to their survival. The oldest civilizations, the Sumerians, Egyptians, and Chinese, began to make more systematic observations of the sky. They developed calendars, predicted eclipses, and even began to study the planets. It was at this time, roughly 5,000 years ago, that astronomy, the world's oldest science, was born. Later in the ancient Greek world, astronomy became a major branch of science. Aristotle and Ptolemy made important contributions to our understanding of the solar system. They believed that the Earth was at the center of the universe and that the planets and stars revolved around it. It is because science builds on the theories and discoveries that came before that we are able to learn otherwise. Astronomers like the 16th century's Nicholas Copernicus tested those theories, built on that knowledge, and learned of new wonders using a variety of techniques to study the universe. Modern means include satellites, radio observatories, and computer models, models which allow modern astronomers to simulate the formation and evolution of galaxies and stars, and to better understand our place in the universe, and to learn about the origins of life here on Earth, and even the possibilities of life elsewhere. But the most important tool in an astronomer's kit is the telescope. The invention of the telescope in the 17th century revolutionized astronomy. Galileo Galilei used a telescope to make many important discoveries, including the four largest moons of Jupiter and the phases of Venus. Johannes Kepler used his own observations to show that the planets orbit the sun in elliptical orbits. Isaac Newton developed the laws of motion and gravity which provided a theoretical framework for understanding the motion of the planets and the stars. In the 19th century, astronomers began to study the stars and galaxies using spectroscopy. Spectroscopy is a technique that can be used to identify the chemical composition of stars and galaxies. This led to the discovery that the sun and stars are made of the same elements as Earth, and that the universe is much larger than previously thought. The 20th century saw the development of new astronomical techniques, such as radio astronomy and infrared astronomy. These techniques allowed astronomers to study objects that were invisible to the naked eye or even to telescopes. They also led to the discovery of new objects, such as black holes, regions of space with gravity so strong that even light cannot escape and quasars, black holes powered by the nucleus of a young galaxy. Today, astronomy is a vast and complex field of science. Incorporating other scientific disciplines, such as physics and chemistry, mathematics, computer science, geology, and biology. Astronomers use a wide range of techniques to study the universe, from ground-based telescopes to space-based observatories. They are always working to understand the formation and evolution of galaxies, the origin of stars and planets, and the nature of dark matter and dark energy, which make up and power most of the universe. But before we look at the stars with the two most technologically advanced telescopes ever invented, let us honor one of the people who made this Star Trek possible. Dr. Robert Hutchings Goddard was a physicist mechanical engineer, an inventor who is considered the father of modern rocketry. He is credited with developing the liquid-fueled rocket, and his work was instrumental in the development of space. He was born in Worcester, Massachusetts in 1882. On an October afternoon in 1899, when Goddard was just 17 years old, 
he climbed a cherry tree on his aunt's farm to prune it. While up there, he had a vision for a device that would break free of the gravity of the Earth and transverse the nearly 128 million miles to Mars. He wrote in his diary, quote, I was a different boy when I descended that tree from when I ascended, for existence at last seemed very purposive. That day, October 19, 1899, was of such significance to Goddard that he christened it Anniversary Day and made some reference to it in his diary almost every year. Goddard was a brilliant student, earning a Ph.D. in physics from Clark University in 1914. After graduating, Goddard began his pioneering work on the development of rockets. He was convinced that rockets could be used to travel to space, and he began conducting experiments in his backyard. His theoretical treatise, A Method of Reaching Extreme Altitudes, was published in 1919, and it outlined the methods he believed could get us not only to the moon, but his boyhood dream destination of Mars. But his detractors and critics were merciless. A 1920 New York Times editorial stated that Goddard's ideas were utter nonsense, that no one will ever go to the moon, and that the scientist seems to lack the knowledge ladled out daily in high schools. Goddard thereafter became tight-lipped about his theories and his successful proofs of them, so much so that it likely delayed the development of the entire U.S. space program. In 1926, the tenacious Goddard launched the first liquid-fueled rocket from a field on his aunt's farm in Auburn in central Massachusetts. The rocket reached an altitude of 41 feet, and it was a major breakthrough in the development of modern rocketry. Goddard then further developed the concept of the multi-stage rocket that he laid out in his 1914 patent and engineered the first gyroscopic guidance system for rockets, both of which are essential to humans and their fantastic instruments leaving Earth for destinations beyond. Dr. Robert H. Goddard died in 1945 at the age of 62, having received little recognition or acclaim during his lifetime. However, in 1959, he was not only awarded the Congressional Gold Medal and dubbed the Father of Spaceflight, but NASA also named their spaceflight center in Greenbelt, Maryland, after him. In 1960, NASA made a million-dollar financial settlement to Goddard's widow and loving flamekeeper, Esther, paid in recognition of the hundreds of his rocket-related patents that had already been incorporated in their designs as the U.S. entered a space race with Soviet Russia. In 1969, the New York Times published an apology to Dr. Goddard nearly 24 years after his death and close to 50 years after their short-sighted and scathing criticism of him. The apology was published on July 17, 1969, the day after the Apollo 11 mission launched for the moon and three days before Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin became the first humans to step foot on the moon. The Hubble Space Telescope was launched in 1990 and remains in operation today. It was named after Edwin Hubble, an astronomer who discovered that the universe is expanding. The Hubble is a joint project of NASA and the European Space Agency. It is a large, free-flying telescope that orbits the Earth at an altitude of about 342 miles. The Hubble's primary mirror is about 8 feet in diameter which is much larger than the mirrors on ground-based telescopes. This allows the Hubble to see much fainter objects than ground-based telescopes. The Hubble has made many important discoveries, including the age of the universe, which is approximately 13.8 billion years, the existence of supermassive black holes, the formation of galaxies, the composition of stars and planets, the atmospheres of exoplanets. The Hubble has been a powerful tool for astronomers, and it has revolutionized our understanding of the universe. It is expected to continue operating until at least 2030, 
when the Earth's gravity will claim it and it will enter our atmosphere and burn up in a blaze of final glory. The Hubble Space Telescope and the James Webb Space Telescope will complement each other in the study of celestial objects. They are different sizes will be at different locations, and have different instruments that cover different wavelengths. But together, they will help answer some of the most fundamental and inspirational questions that we have about our universe. Take in this moment. Remember this time right now, right before you see everything. I mean, this is going to change everything. This is the dawn of a new era. This is the result of a collective dream. Today is a historic day. Six and a half months ago, a rocket launched from Earth, carrying the world's newest, most powerful deep space telescope on a journey one million miles into the cosmos. It's a new window into the history of our universe. And today we're going to get a glimpse of the first light to shine through that window. I am thrilled and I'm relieved because you know when you start something this big, you know there's always a possibility. It might not work. It did work. We are so proud. Right, here we go. Okay, so the first image is a deep field. And it's also a deep field with a cluster. And the, the important thing to realize is that there's quite a lot of mass in the galaxy cluster and it acts as a, a magnifying source, a lens, to, to stretch and distort the light and make intrinsically faint objects brighter so that we can see further away galaxies. There it is. It's called Stefan's Quintet and it's wondrous. This is a very important image uh, and, and area to study because it really shows uh, the type of interaction that drives the evolution of galaxies. So it's appropriate now that I send the broadcast to our colleagues and friends at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore. That's the scientific nerd center of the entire Webb mission. We're sitting here outside of the Mission Operations Center, which is the key central hub for Webb. We are ready to see Webb's first image of a star dying, a planetary nebula called the Southern Ring. Wow. Neris has found definitive evidence for water in a hot gas giant exoplanet's atmosphere. That exoplanet is called WASP-96b. And we can see from this beautiful data that there is water in the atmosphere. And also there's evidence for haze and clouds, which couldn't be seen before. You know, every dot of light we see here is an individual star, not unlike our sun. And many of these likely also have planets. And it just reminds me that, you know, our sun and our planets and ultimately us were formed out of the same kind of stuff that we see here. We humans really are connected to the universe. We're made of the same stuff in this beautiful landscape. And I think we should all feel extremely fortunate to be here at this moment in time when all of this is happening in the building where we control this technological marvel from a million miles away. The infrared photons that have been traveling across the universe for billions of years are captured by Webb's giant segmented mirror. They nestle their way into some detector, one of the amazing detectors that it has. And then they're sent across in that million mile chasm back to us and then disseminated to the rest of the world. This is where a new scientific journey begins as thousands of astronomers throughout the world will now be able to access the AWST data for the first time to start doing science. Webb's first images are just the first look. We have a fully operational telescope 
that will make new discoveries and the science will fuel the sense of wonder and exploration for generations to come. In the words of the famous Carl Sagan, somewhere something incredible is waiting to be known. I think those words are becoming reality. The James Webb Space Telescope was launched on December 25, 2021, and is the largest and most powerful telescope ever built, designed to study the universe in infrared light. Some of the major features of the Webb Telescope include a 21-foot primary mirror, which is the largest ever deployed in space, a sun shield that is the size of a tennis court, which will protect the telescope from the heat of the sun four scientific instruments that will allow the telescope to study the universe in infrared light. A cryogenic operating temperature of minus 223 degrees centigrade, the extreme cold necessary for the telescope's instruments to work properly. The Webb telescope is truly a groundbreaking instrument that promises to revolutionize our understanding of the universe. It is bound to make many new discoveries in the years to come.
things that the Webb telescope has already photographed. The telescope is only just beginning its mission. With another eight years planned, and another ten years possible before it settles into its own permanent orbit beyond the moon. In the years to come, it is sure to deliver many more amazing images to us here on this pale blue dot. And as Carl Sagan said, For myself, I like a universe that includes much that is unknown, and at the same time, much that is knowable. A universe in which everything is known would be static and dull, as boring as the heaven of some weak-minded theologians. A universe that is unknowable is no fit place for a thinking being.